Thank you for joining me again today for another episode of History's Who Yesterday's Nation. This video is part of a YouTube History Channel collaboration focused on Imperial Chinese history, so be sure to check out the playlist so you can enjoy other videos on the topic. You'll find the link to the playlist in the description below. By the end of the short-lived Chen Dynasty, Imperial Chinese society was in turmoil. The last emperor, Chen Shi Wang, had become extremely paranoid and obsessed with immortality. He ruled society with an iron fist and had vast teams of forced laborers who performed his large-scale domestic infrastructure projects. A peasant named Liu Bang had been put in charge of delivering a group of laborers to the site of the first emperor's mausoleum. However, somewhere along the journey, some of the men escaped. Rather than face death or imprisonment for his crime, he instead decided to free the rest of his servants. Many of the freed slaves joined with Liu Bang and formed a coalition of marauding bandits. By 209 BC, similar uprisings took place across the land and the Chen Dynasty descended into chaos, as rebellions sprung up in every province. Many leaders began declaring themselves kings of numerous states and the young emperor could no longer hold on to power. Eventually, two primary leaders emerged from among the rebels, Liu Bang and Xiang Yu of Chu. When the Chen Dynasty had fallen, Xiang subdivided the empire into 18 different kingdoms and named Liu Bang as the King of Han. Upset with the refusal to give him all of his promised territory, Liu seized the lands, setting off a four-year war for supremacy over the kingdoms. Liu Bang led his men to victory and was soon after made ruler of the realm and given the name Emperor Gaozu, and the Han Dynasty was birthed. Though he kept many of the centralized governance practiced by the earlier Chen Dynasty, he also sought to limit corruption by establishing a meritocracy within the state. Bureaucrats could no longer hold influential government positions based on heredity alone. He implemented civil service exams that individuals were expected to pass to earn their title rather than inherit it. Gaozu also freed those who had sold themselves into servitude, lowered taxes, made peace with the Xiongnu, and encouraged entrepreneurship and education for the lower classes. These reforms led to a flourishing of culture, booming population growth, and significant prosperity among the citizens. The result was a true golden age in China. However, the empire wasn't free of problems. The nomadic Xiongnu continued to perform occasional raids along the borders. And, though Gaozu had established vassal kings within the empire, he had slowly replaced many of these leaders with members of his own family, which created some contention. His wife, the Empress, had also grown disgruntled with the Emperor and his many concubines. During Gaozu's reign, she had been given much power in the decision-making process and had grown into a formidable political force within the government. Following the death of Gaozu, her son succeeded as ruler but his young age provided her with more power as she now served as regent. In order to prevent pretenders to her son's throne, she went on a murder spree, killing all who she thought may stand in her way. First on the list was her late husband's favorite concubine. The Empress poisoned her 12-year-old son, then ordered her to be tortured and mutilated. One son of Gaozi was imprisoned and starved to death, and another committed suicide after Lu Zhi poisoned his favorite concubine. While her cutthroat behavior turned many against her, the chief of the nomad Xiongnu tribe was impressed. In his love letter, he offered a proposal. I'm a lonesome ruler, born in marshes and raised in plains populated by livestock. I've visited your border numerous times and wanted to tour China. Your majesty is now alone and living in solitude. Since both of us are not happy and have nothing to entertain ourselves, I'm willing to use what I possess to exchange for what you lack. She promptly declined his invitation and instead sent him two carriages and eight horses to placate him. When her son was married, the dowager advised the new empress to follow in her footsteps. Since the couple did not have children together, Empress Zhang Yan adopted eight boys who were likely born of his concubines and then murdered their mothers. When Emperor Hui died in 188 BC, this tactic backfired as Gao Zhu had established a law that stated only imperial clan members could be princes, and the young emperor was legally disqualified from governance. The dowager then tried to find more of her extended family members as potential successors. While her strategies were not without protest, she succeeded in putting her allies in positions of power, declaring her lover and an obedient minister as the left and right chancellors of the kingdom. Soon the empress was handing out fiefdoms to family and filling the government with trusted friends. When the young emperor was made aware of the truth about his birth mother, he vowed revenge. 
Lu Xi then had him confined, told the court officials that he was sick, and then proposed that he be replaced due to his being unfit to rule. Subsequently, the young emperor was put to death and his brother was chosen to be the new leader. When Lu died at the age of 61, administrators swiftly eliminated her appointed clan members from among the ranks and chose a surviving grandson of another concubine, Consort Bo, to be the new emperor. Without Lu's constant court meddling, the empire was finally able to return to a point of stability. The 23-year-old Emperor Wen quickly adapted to his new role and governed well. His wife had a major influence on his adoption of Taoist practices. He also had a strong appreciation for Confucianism, and both ideologies were reflected in his just laws. Harsh punishments that were once commonplace, such as cutting off noses and facial tattooing, were outlawed and replaced with whipping. He also created assistance programs for orphans, widowers, and senior citizens who did not have loved ones to care for them. Wen also encouraged his administrators to freely criticize the government in order to implement reforms when needed. And like his grandfather, he also reduced taxes to only 3.3%. Emperor Wen also brought major economic reforms by allowing any person to mint coins from tin and copper. This policy was vastly different than the centralized money of previous administrations. Even in his death, he placed others before himself. Traditionally, the mourning of a fallen emperor involved a long period where people were expected to sacrifice normal daily life, giving up the use of alcohol, meat, and celebrations. The concubines of the dead leader that were without children were also expected to become guardians of their former lover's resting place for the remainder of their lives. In Emperor Wen's will, he allowed his concubines to return home to their families and reduce the mourning period to only three days. His son, Emperor Jing, was also held in high esteem and continued many of his father's policies. But cracks began to form. The Liu family members who had been given titles and estates under the first Han Emperor had enjoyed the lax laws of their rulers. Many of them had set themselves up in luxurious properties and in some cases altogether ignored the authority of the imperial government. Jing's advisors suggested that they find a way to limit the powers of these families by carving out territories within their domains, thus curbing their influence over the kingdom as a whole. Of course, this angered the leaders of the affected principalities and led to the rebellion of the seven states. After quelling the uprising, new laws were put into place that kept the vassal kings in check to the centralized imperial government. Appointments within the principalities were made by the imperial authority rather than the kings. Though the princes were allowed to collect a portion of taxes from the people in their territories in order to acquire a personal income. Emperor Wu, also known as Han Wudi, assumed control of the Han Dynasty in 141 BC. Under his long reign, many changes took place. Han emperors before him subscribed to the Taoist philosophy of Wu Wei, which encouraged a hands-off approach to governance. Wudi chose a different path. Rather than taking a defensive position against the Xiangnu and other threats, the emperor went on the offensive. He enacted a series of reforms that included establishing Confucianism as the official state philosophy. The aristocrats who had grown accustomed to life at the imperial court were sent home to their fiefdoms rather than living off of court resources. All tolls and checkpoints that had been established by lords were confiscated and placed in the service of the central government, which reduced the income of the vassal states and increased the coffers of the imperial leaders. Widespread corruption was brought to a halt with harsh legal penalties against infractions, like the seizure of property for those who engaged in illegal activities. Meritocracy was also reinstated as positions within the bureaucracy were given to commoners who passed civil service exams, much like Gao Zhu had done before him. These changes made the emperor unpopular among the nobles, who frequently sought to eliminate reformist advisors from the ranks in order to curb the ruler's grasp for power. To counteract these difficulties, Emperor Wu created his own insider court that consisted of three lords and nine ministers. Once he had obtained enough control of court affairs, he embarked on even more ambitious endeavors. Emperor Wu began conquering neighboring territories, expanding the empire's reach farther south. He also waged war against the troublesome Xiangnu, breaking the peace treaties and expelling many of the nomads out of the northern border areas. This allowed Wu to enlarge the Silk Road and resulted in an increase of goods and supplies from foreign lands. These military successes were not so easily won, though, and cost the imperial court a lot of money. 
He utilized the power of his new centralized government to engage in economic reforms designed to ease the financial burden. Wu put an end to the low taxes established by his predecessors. Government monopolies were also created to control lucrative commodities, such as liquor, iron, and salt. The span of the Han Dynasty was momentarily disrupted in 9 AD, when Wang Meng usurped the throne of the infant Han Emperor and established the Xin Dynasty. He immediately set about reforming the nation's laws by nationalizing land, redistributing wealth, outlawing slavery, and introducing new currencies. While these political and economic transformations created many enemies, none of them were as formidable as nature itself. In the years 3 and 11 AD, large floods created massive problems for citizens. Thousands of displaced peasants began joining migrant bandits, and before long, these rebels had formed into an organized uprising known as the Red Eyebrows. Despite numerous attempts to stifle the revolts, their men were able to successfully infiltrate the palace, where he was executed in 23 AD. After the emperor's death, Gangxi attempted to restore the Han Dynasty, but was assassinated by the Red Eyebrows and replaced with a young puppet ruler they could easily control. Their inability to maintain law and order put a quick end to their movement, and Han leadership wasn't officially resurrected until Guangwu defeated other claimants to the empire and took the throne. The restored dynasty has become known as the Eastern Han period, and the former as the Western Han. The aftermath of the chaotic civil war led to much instability at the beginning of the Eastern Han dynasty. Territories in modern-day Korea and the Tarim Basin were lost. The new emperor also had to quell a rebellion led by the Vietnamese Trung sisters in 40 AD. In subsequent years, relationships with foreign lands became much more important. The economic opportunities presented by the Silk Road gave the Han Dynasty the ability to trade and conduct diplomatic negotiations with the Kushan, Parthian, and Roman leaders of the time. While the realm enjoyed many advancements, discontent was still rampant in court life as multiple groups vied for positions of power, particularly between the imperial eunuchs and Confucian University scholars and students. During this time, Emperor Ling led a decadent lifestyle, enjoying his grandiose military parades and concubines rather than governing his kingdom. This allowed the eunuchs and court officials to freely impose heavy taxes on the peasantry and sell positions of office. These actions destroyed the original civil service system that had been a hallmark of the Han Dynasty. Moral deterioration among the elite inspired the growth of religious and spiritual-based uprisings among the inhabitants. The Five Pecks of Rice and Yellow Turban Rebellions were led by Taoist leaders that enjoyed widespread popularity. These revolts were eventually weakened through military intervention. However, the generals of the militia forces were able to gain more political power and sought to overthrow the court eunuchs. They would get their wish after the death of Emperor Ling. In the battle for control over the new sovereign, the generals took the opportunity to disrupt the power of the eunuchs with a military coup. More than 2,000 of the court eunuchs were killed in the conflict. General Dong Zhu quickly took control of the empire by naming himself chancellor and working through his newly appointed puppet emperor. He fell out of favor quickly due to his strict governance and sadistic treatment of captives. Soon, a coalition force of enemies actively campaigned against him. As the rebels gained momentum, he retreated to a new location with the young emperor in his possession. Before escaping, however, he made sure to loot the Han Emperor's tombs and burned the city of Luoyang to the ground. This included a vast library that resulted in the loss of thousands of historical texts. Eventually, Dong was killed by his own guards and the kingdom was split into three separate states, thus ending the long-lived Han Dynasty. While all things must eventually come to an end, the Han Dynasty greatly influenced ancient China and the world at large during its more than 400-year reign. Developments of the era include paper, wheelbarrows, deep drilling, suspension bridges, seismographs, ships with rudders, and many other technologies. During this time period, the empire came into contact with the West and established the Silk Road within their territories. The philosophies, economic policies, and systems of governance employed by the Han leaders continued to have a large impact on subsequent dynasties. Today, more than 1.5 billion people around the world proudly proclaim to be Han Chinese, which amounts to nearly 20% of the global population. The legacy of the Han emperors still reverberate in our modern society. What contribution do you think the Han Dynasty made to the history of humanity? Let us know in the comments below. 
Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. This video is part of a larger history YouTube collaboration. Be sure to check out the other videos in the playlist by following the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.